Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Disney pulls the plug on Netflix and unveils plans in the pipeline to roll out family films on its own streaming service. CEO Bob Iger joins us to discuss today's earnings report and the way forward for the House of Mouse. Plus, a potential lawsuit and even a WikiLeaks job offer are all part of the fallout after Google fired the engineer who wrote that controversial diversity memo. We've got all the angles covered on this developing Silicon Valley story. And Lending Club could be shaking off its losing streak. CEO Scott Sanborn joins us to discuss the online borrowers improving fortunes and a near record earnings report in a Bloomberg exclusive. First, to our lead. President Donald Trump ratcheting up the war of words with North Korea after a report in Washington in the Washington Post said North Korea had successfully developed a miniaturized nuclear warhead that could fit on its missiles. The president spoke to reporters in New Jersey. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. The president's comments also come just days after the U.N. Security Council targeted sanctions on North Korea. Joining us now from Washington, Rob Levinson, senior defense analyst for Bloomberg government. So, Rob, what do you make of these comments, very serious comments from President Trump and the impact they might have on North Korea? Well, yes, they are uh, very serious. We're sort of matching the North Korean rhetoric sort of one for one. The North Koreans are famous for this sort of rhetoric, and uh, President Trump seems to be willing to match them one for one. And, you know, the, the worry is, is we really don't understand how the North Koreans interpret uh, things like this. And, uh, you know, this can only probably escalate the tensions between the two countries. So with potential testing going on right now, what does that mean? Well, uh, you know, unfortunately for the United States, there's not a lot of great options here. We really don't want them to continue testing these missiles and threatening the United States. But, you know, our options are basically, you know, negotiate, uh, engage in some sort of military operation, which could very quickly escalate into a full-scale war on the peninsula, or sort of learn to live with a... Uh, uh, North Korean nuclear capability that can range the United States. None of those are very palatable options, and I'm sure, you know, President Trump and his national security staff are going through that right now, trying to figure out what to do. This, as Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is traveling throughout Southeast Asia, he's already made some comments about North Korea. What more are we expecting from other parts of the administration? Well, I think, uh, you know, Secretary Tillerson is going to continue trying to build support among the allies. We had a very strong action from the U.N. It was a, a unanimous vote in the Security Council. Uh, but you, as President Trump has said from the beginning, the real key here is China. And I'd be very interested to watch what statements now come out of Pyongyang, with, uh, rather from Beijing, uh, with this latest revelation about the uh, you know, miniature nuclear weapon. All right, well, we'll be watching any news out of Beijing. Rob Levinson, senior defense analyst at Bloomberg Government. Thanks so much for that update. I want to move on to earnings now, which continue to roll through. One media giant and two online travel firms reporting after the close. Disney sales trailed estimates and shares are dipping after hours. But the big story in its report was that it is cutting ties with Netflix and launching its own direct-to-consumer streaming service. Here to wrap the results, we are joined by Bloomberg's editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, and and with us from London to wrap Priceline, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. Corey, though, I'll start with you. Netflix, no more yeah. Netflix. Disney on Netflix. What does this mean? I think this is a big deal, and I think we need some more clarification from uh, Disney and Netflix about what this means. Uh, let's remember that when Netflix uh, lost its Stars uh, contract a couple of years ago, it was not only a hit to Netflix, they really had to change their business model and really go with a lot more original content. The markets were very forgiving of that, ultimately, as we've seen from the stock price. Uh, but Netflix became a very very different kind of business than what it had been. But Netflix has still had some of those great big hits, the biggest movies out there. Uh, they were still able to sort of say, hey, we're going to have the Avengers. We're going to have our own partnership with Disney, having uh, uh, Daredevil, Luke Cage, a terrific show, Luke Cage, uh, uh, Jessica Jones, planning for uh, a Defenders movie that they were hoping might rival uh, Avengers, but be exclusively on Netflix and be something they can count on going forward. Now that's kind of all up in the air here. So I'll be curious to see what uh, Disney has to say about it. Uh, the Netflix comments, the headlines I've seen have looked a little bit defensive, saying we'll still have you know some 
relationship, still do business with our former partner, but doing business and having their best movies and their best content on the platform are two entirely different things. Right. Uh, looking at some headlines now, Netflix saying they continue to do business with Disney on many fronts. You know, yeah. I'm curious, Bob Iger also on the call right now saying that Disney and Pixar won't be on other web services, that Disney is already working on new films and shows for new web services. Um, you know, what does a new streaming service from Disney look like? Well, I mean, they've tried this kind of thing before. We've seen other companies try this sort of, sort of walled garden approach. Uh, they certainly see the power that Netflix has in their business. And let's not forget their competitor in Amazon Web Services, which is rapidly growing and spending billions of dollars a year. Some estimates putting it at 3 and $4 billion uh, in this current year. It's in terms of spending on content, net Netflix at about double that. So they certainly see the power that these companies have in the marketplace. And I think that there's, of course, a fear that Disney's going to lose what they They've got Disney more than any other content company going back uh, in, in terms of film and broadcast has really kept a walled garden, has limited how they will distribute things going all the way back to the days of VHS when they just wouldn't put their stuff out as much. Uh, maybe the only other company out there that was anywhere near it was Lucas, which had the same sort of relationship with Star Wars. So really protecting that content, controlling how it's released. They think they've got the power to do it all on their own. We shall see. Now, we thought the big headlines would be about ESPN. There have been big concerns right. about subscriber losses there. How is that going? I think that the, the real headline out of the earnings that they announced in terms of the results from Disney weren't so much about what was going on in ESPN. If you look at ESPN as a percentage of revenues, really that change didn't happen a lot as a percentage of revenues uh, and even as a percentage of the profits of the company and the profit margins for that business, still pretty song, uh, strong. Uh, uh, the reliance on uh, ESPN as a percentage of revenues, of course, very big there. But uh, furthermore, when you look at what it meant for Disney in terms of profitability, the profits from ESPN, it's still an incredibly profitable product, maybe not as much as it has been in years past. But I thought that the really interesting thing was in, in the theme park business here, that, that that slide in profitability for ESPN was made up for an increase in profitability by theme parks, uh, maybe a little bit unexpected. It was an anniversary uh, of the opening of the Shanghai Disney, so the costs of the opening went away. That meant more profits for Disney. They also had a really strong uh, showing in Europe, uh, in the European, the, the, the French uh, Disneyland uh, did so well that in the last year with some special events and just better pricing and better attendance, and that was a, a boost to their bottom line. Shanghai Disney welcomed its 10 millionth guest this quarter. Curious whether they can keep up the momentum at the, the China theme park. Caroline, I do want to get to Priceline. Of course, the biggest travel agency in the world, a company that's been very acquisitive. Uh, they're ramping up advertising, and that's showing in the numbers. What do you see? Yeah, you're right. It was all about the third quarter forecast. This is a behemoth in the traveling online sector. I mean, it's a $100 billion valuation. And when you see the shares fall after hours to the tune of 7%, Bang goes $7 billion in terms of market cap, and it is the third quarter that is worrying people. Earnings per share forecast came in below expectations because they're splashing that cash. It's all about trying to fend off the competition. From whom? The likes of Airbnb. This is why you're seeing the likes of Priceline suddenly putting on short-term rentals to try and fend off that part of the market. But Google has also been eating people's lunch in terms of a way of finding out price comparisons on holidays, on flights. And so too is also the hotel and airline industry itself wanting to steal back some of that market and get people to go directly to their own websites. So you are starting to see competition become fierce. And this is why you saw a quarter, so 25% up uptick in the amount that they're spending in advertising, a similar amount that we saw in the previous call, Tremily. All right, well, Priceline has been an analyst favorite. We'll have to see if that changes. Caroline Hyde for us there in London, our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson in New York. Do not miss Disney CEO Bob Iger. He will be joining us later this hour with our own David Weston. Well, Uber is said to plan on unloading its subprime car leasing program. According to people familiar with the matter, exchange leasing, a wholly owned subsidiary, is unsustainable and should be sold or consolidated into a smaller unit within Uber. Its 40,000 car fleet has an estimated loss of $9,000 per vehicle. Uber's board decided to wind down the program last month after realizing costs were much higher than originally thought. Coming up, the manifesto that's created an uproar in Silicon Valley. What happened to the engineer who wrote a memo criticizing Google's diversity efforts and why the story is far from over? This is Bloomberg.
Google has fired the male engineer who is at the center of an uproar in Silicon Valley. This after he authored an internal 10-page memo asserting there are biological causes behind gender inequality in the tech industry. James Damore, the author of the memo, says he's exploring all possible legal remedies. A decision by Google has caused an uproar on social media. Critics of the move say it's censorship and it encourages employees to file complaints. Managing director of Teal Capital Eric Weinstein wrote, Dear Google, stop teaching my girl that her path to financial freedom lies not in coding but in complaining to HR. Thanks in advance. A dad. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt, who's been reporting this story, some of the backlash there. Uh, another dad who said, Dear Eric Weinstein, I teach my daughters that they don't have to accept misogyny. Thanks. A better dad. Uh, but there, there has been a lot of backlash. How would you describe a uh, firestorm out there? I would say it's in two major camps, people who think that um, the memo was, you know, um, not arguably, it was just hurtful, offensive, did not belong at Google and that he should have been fired. And then people who see Google firing him for speaking up about saying that conservative or unpopular viewpoints are not accepted at Google and as proving his point, as saying that he, you know, brought up these points that were not widely well received and that he was fired for it. Um, so it's, you know, I think it was already a really contentious matter over the weekend and then their decision to fire him Monday afternoon made things only hotter. What do we know about how Google came to the conclusion that he should be fired? Because this memo was out there internally for a few days. It took several days. It took several days, and then they made this decision. Yeah, and in the end, it um, they cited the code of conduct. They said that his memo had violated the code of conduct. Over the weekend, they'd given a statement that was a little more um, equivocal. They said, you know, we want to have this be a place where people can bring up alternate viewpoints, but also we want to make sure people are not being harassed and, and keep in mind anti-discrimination laws. But in the end, uh, the CEO said that it had violated the code of conduct, and then, um, you know, the engineer told us that he had been fired for, as he put it, perpetuating gender stereotypes. Uh, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, saying it advanced harmful gender stereotypes in the workplace. Uh, that said, uh, this engineer said he is pursuing legal action. Right. Does he so have a case? I think that's debatable. You know, legal experts say that it, it's kind of a hard um, case to make that um, you have to show that he was, I think, trying to do um, coer like coercive action within the company or, or collective action and then was being fired in retaliation for that. And there are other few uh, far shot cases that, that might work. But he said he told us he's pursuing, you know, or he's looking into all legal options. He also filed a case with the NLRB against Google on Monday. And we also, I think, know that he may have spoken to HR last week about um, other, so it seems like he's he's been making moves to um, to try to lay a groundwork for maybe some legal case. One of the points that I don't think we've discussed enough is that the peer review process at Google is huge. I mean, yeah. it is a huge part of their culture. You review your peers, right? And you know, how does Google move on from this internally? What kind of discussions are had? I think the peer review system was something that really came up when employees were saying, this is why I can't continue to work at Google if he is still here. It's a really cooperative workplace, and you also involve your peers in your reviews, which determines your pay, your bonus, your position, any promotions. Um, it would be, I think, really hard to separate um, an engineer that had become sort of an internal pariah from the systems that Google has in place. And I think many people felt that if he continued to work at Google, it would be a major reason that they would consider quitting. Google's also facing a lawsuit that it systematically discriminates against women based on pay. Yeah. This with the Department of Labor. What's the status of that? Our understanding is it's still ongoing. I think there have been maybe some minor wins or losses on, on either side, but it's, you know, it's still the Department of Labor trying to get Google to give them more information about how they determine pay internally. Um, Google has claimed that there's no gender pay gap, that they've done their own internal analyses and, and found that conclusion. Um, clearly, there's still a disagreement on whether that's true. All right, well, I know the discussion about this will continue on air, on social media. Ellen Hewitt, thanks so much thanks. for that update. Coming up, there is a global talent war brewing for engineers with AI skills. We'll talk to a man looking to help fill those vacancies. This is Bloomberg. Chinese ride-sharing giant Didi Chuxing is expanding once again. 
Didi is investing in Kareem, a ride-hailing platform that currently operates in the Middle East, North Africa, and Pakistan. The move comes a week after Didi made its first major push into Europe by backing Estonia's Taxify. Users will be able to hail Didi and Kareem cars from the same app. Kareem currently operates in 80 cities across 13 countries. Well, the use of artificial intelligence continues to grow daily, from the products we use and buy to the jobs it is helping create. A recent study by McKinsey says in 2016, total investments in AI uh, were between 26 to $39 billion. Another study by PESA says that just in the U.S., there are currently more than 10,000 job openings in the field. One person looking to help fill those jobs, Andrew Ng, he led Chinese internet giant Baidu's AI research division in Silicon Valley, and today he published his vision for a series of online courses designed to help people become AI experts. Andrew, great to have you back here on the show. Thanks for having me. So talk to us about how these courses work. So anyone that wants to break into AI can go to deeplearning.ai or go to Coursera today and sign up for one of these courses. You know, I think AI is the new electricity. Uh, just like electricity transformed every major industry 100 years ago, AI will now do the same. But I have a lot of CEO friends or a lot of engineer friends wondering, how do I break into AI? How do I get a job? How do I learn this? That knowledge has been hard to access, but we're now starting to put it out there so that anyone that wants to break into AI, I think now has a much more well-lit path. There is a lot of competition when it comes to online education. Of course, there's Udacity, and there are other, especially when it comes to technical skills, um, the idea that you can teach these online. How do you stand out? You know, I think that uh, Coursera has great content from many top universities, and so people that take Coursera courses are reassured that they're really high quality. And in the case of deep learning, really bleeding edge AI, I don't think there's that much great content. You can get surface level cursory content, but something that really lets you understand it, master it, know how it works in the industry, practice it, uh, there's not that, 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 that much well curated courses out there today. So there's a big shortage in AI talent. Yeah. Tell us how big and how serious this shortage is. You know, if you take seriously the idea that AI is the new electricity, think of how many electrical engineers uh, and how many electricians our society had to hire to take advantage of the capabilities of electricity. You know, if electric power in your house goes out, you find you suddenly miss it an awful lot. And I think we should be on the path to build an AI-powered society. A decade from now, I want all of us to have great self-driving cars, I want low-cost, high-quality healthcare for everyone, I want every child to have a personalized education. The only way for us to get there is that millions of people around the world building these great AI things. You uh, have an interesting view, given that you worked at Baidu, on the competition between the U.S. and China for AI talent. How fierce is that competition? You know, I think the U.S. China um, competition is a false dichotomy. Really? That I think the U.S. learns a lot from China more and more. China's learned a lot from the U.S. And this is one of those things where the more people do it, the more we're all better off. Right, but we're not sharing resources. There's a finite amount of people, as you say. Uh, I think that the number of people that know AI is not finite. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what, six years ago, my Coursera course, my machine learning course, launched uh, eventually wound up turning to Coursera. 1.8 million people since then, since six years ago, have signed up to take my old machine learning course. So we've brought a lot of people into machine learning. I hope that with the deep learning courses we just announced today, we'll bring maybe an equally large number of people into deep learning. You know, we've been talking a lot about the lack of women in tech, uh, you know, more women needing to know how to code, but it's not just about coding, it's getting women into these now more specialized fields like AI. Do you see any, do you see an overrepresentation of men in these fields as well? I think as a, I'm very fortunate to be married to Carol Riley, who's a co-founder of a, a autonomous driving company, Drive.ai. So in my house, I guess, there's one male AI leader and one female AI leader. So that seems quite balanced. But, but I, what about I, I, in the courses that you're teaching? I know, it is a serious issue. I think, I, I think that uh, uh, courses that are online uh, do give very, you know, do give equal access to all genders. Uh, but I think that so far, technical courses still tend to be more male dominated. I think there's important work for all of us to do. You know, the gender bias or gender unconscious bias, uh, uh, better equality, something that all of us have to take seriously in Silicon Valley. And how important is it given that AI, as you say, could be the new electricity to have input from a whole diversity of perspectives. To your point, my advice, therefore, <laughs> to every woman and to every man is if you want a new job, this is a great time to jump into AI. All right. Andrew Ng, co-founder of Coursera, thank you so much thank for you. stopping by.
Coming up, an exclusive interview with the CEO of Lending Club, Scott Sanborn, on the company's latest earnings report, how the peer-to-peer -peer lender was able to turn the corner after the surprise ousting of its former CEO. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. such an interesting new world. The world is changing. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. A lot will change over the next five years. We feel like we can maybe help people out more. I see the stock price flying <laughs> sky high. All the people that work here, we know we have a very big responsibility. And we want Facebook to help do good in the world. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. President Trump is responding to North Korea's warning when it announced on Monday the U.S. will, quote, pay dearly for imposing new sanctions in retaliation for the North's weapons program. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. Former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is among thousands of observers in Kenya today as that country votes for its next president. Incumbent Uhuru Kenyatta has an early lead against the challenger Raila Odinga in a race said to be too close to call. Jacob Zuma will remain president of South Africa after a motion of no confidence failed in parliament today. Zuma had already survived six previous attempts to unseat him, but today's was the first to be held by secret ballot. Foreign ministers from 14 nations met in Peru today to decide on a response to Venezuela's political crisis. That's as President Nicolas Maduro's new and all-powerful constitutional assembly decreed itself to all other government institutions. Officials say the death toll from a powerful earthquake in southwestern China has risen to seven people. 88 others are reportedly injured, 21 seriously. Reports say the quake measured a magnitude 6.5. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 7.30 Wednesday morning in Sydney. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Adam Haig with a look at the markets. Adam, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Well, Trump rattling the U.S. session looks like it'll wash through to Asia this morning. We're looking at Japanese Nikkei 225 futures down about 0.5%. Uh, uh, that should wash through to Australia and South Korean markets as well. South Korean markets already taking a little bit of a tumble yesterday. There's rising tension, of course, uh, north of the border, but also PMI is pretty weak and those tax hikes really taking stocks down there. The Aussie dollar holding around 75 cents. Uh, ahead of a speech by Assistant Governor Chris Kent at Bloomberg's office in Sydney this morning. I'm Bloomberg's Adam Haig in Sydney for you. Technology, I'm Emily Chang. Shares of peer-to-peer -peer online lender Lending Club are surging the most in two years. This comes after the San Francisco-based company posted its second highest quarterly revenues in its history Monday, seeing net revenue spike 35% year over year to $139 million. The impressive report coming about a year after the now former CEO Renaud Laplanche was ousted after the board found problems with lending practices and his lack of disclosure surrounding a personal investment. Joining me now in a TV exclusive Lending Club CEO 
know Scott Sanborn. Scott, great to have you here on the show. Thank you for having me. So you were president when this happened. I know it's been a long year for you. Talk to me about what the path to recovery has been like from within. Yeah, it's really been about investing in the foundation of the business and putting in the right controls and uh, bringing investors back to the platform. A uh, critical piece of that is banks, and we announced that in Q2, 44% of our funding came from banks providing capital to fund the loans on the platform. When it comes to the scandal that uh, you've now moved beyond, I mean, do you feel like the company is back in a good place? Yeah, is, is it completely behind? I, I think both the results we delivered this quarter and uh, what I just talked about is having our investors back on the platform uh, it, it are both clear signs that we are looking ahead. So. Your main competition is credit card companies. No small uh, opponent to take on. Where are you gaining the most ground? So if you look at what's happening in the broader market right now, there's over a trillion dollars in outstanding credit card debt. So more than half of Americans have had credit card debt in the last 12 months. What we're doing is saying, look, if you haven't paid off your credit card, you have a loan, and it's probably not a very good one. And in general, we make it very easy for them to save, on average, about 24% in interest versus that product. So that's really the core audience that we're going after. This also suggests though, that lending standards could be getting looser, right? I mean, where do you think we are in the credit cycle? So, because uh, a hundred trillion dollars in outstanding credit card balances is as much as before the financial crisis. Uh, it's actually higher, yeah. It's higher. So um, one of the powerful things about our model is we make all of the performance on our loans publicly available. So our investors can actually see for every loan we've ever issued, uh, both over 100 credit attributes for that loan. So what, what does it look like from a credit perspective, but also what's the payment history? Mm -hmm. um, and what we are seeing, which we talked about, is we did see deterioration in credit performance uh, about 18 months ago. We started talking about it. We took very swift action, and what we're seeing right now is stabilization in performance and our loss rates and our most importantly forecasted returns for investors remain in line. So when do you think we're going to start to see things turn? Will we start to see things turn? So that's obviously pretty hard to predict. I think what you're hearing right now is in certain markets, the auto market is starting to see uh, signs of deterioration, as is credit card. Uh, but on the flip side, you're still seeing a lot of things to like in the macro environment for consumers. Unemployment is very low. Inflation remains low. Oil prices remain low. Uh, household formation is up. So these things are counterbalancing. I think the thing to watch here is consumers' ability to service the debt that they've accumulated. Right now, overall debt has moved away from mortgage, moves into student, auto, credit card. Uh, so that's the thing to watch. What risks are you being vigilant of as you grow loan origination? Yeah, so it is critically important for us to be good stewards of uh, credit performance. Uh, we are aided in that not only by the data that we generate. We, you know, we are the largest provider of personal loans. We've been doing this for 10 years, so we have a lot that we can see and compare. But we also have, you know, last quarter over 100 institutional investors purchased from us. They also have very sophisticated credit analysts looking at our data and giving us feedback. So the the signs we're looking for are the consumers who appear to be accumulating. Data and not actually doing what they intended, which is to pay down or pay off uh, the debt that they took a loan from us to eliminate. Your board includes John Mack, former Morgan Stanley CEO, Correct. Larry Summers, Mary Meeker, people who have weathered the financial crisis, weathered the dot-com bust. What are they telling you about risk? Uh, so uh, it's it's an exceptional board. They've been uh, incredibly useful to help guide the company and set the course forward. I think right now they're looking uh, looking to the company to help illustrate what the risks are in the market and make sure we're executing prudently and deliberately. And important to note that our our execution in Q2 is really about product experience and marketing experience. It's really not related to credit. You launched your first securitization this quarter. How big a part of your funding mix? So uh, was so the loans that were contributed to the securitization were actually loans that had bought historically. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the overall funding mix, it remains a pretty small uh, percent. But what it does do is introduce us to a whole new group of investors. We had over 20 new investors uh, who participated who need to buy a rated asset. So that was great to see, and a lot of it showed a lot of demand for the lending club asset. Speaking about this new class of investors, I mean, you guys started as a peer-to-peer -peer lending business now. In 
individual investors are just like 15% of right. your business. Do you see that channel going away completely no. or decreasing? No, we don't. So one, individual investors are still, if you, if you look at them truly as individual, are actually closer to 40, 45%, but how they're participating is changing. Mm. So we continue to have the direct retail experience where people can come to the website and build a portfolio with really just a few thousand dollars. Uh, but we also have a variety of funds available that are that are uh, available through partners in the ecosystem as well through an independent uh, investment advisor. So there are multiple ways for people to participate. There's 40 Act funds uh, available to individuals through their RIAs. So we're really seeing lots of ways for individuals to access the asset class and that will continue to be important. All right, Scott Sanborn, Lending Club CEO. Thanks so much for stopping by. All right, great to you. have you. A story we are watching, H-1B visa is the program widely criticized for costing American workers their jobs, has actually provided some economic benefits for both the U.S. and India. This according to a new study out of the Center for Global Development and the University of Michigan. The study showed combined incomes for the two countries as a result of the U.S. visa program rose by about $17.3 billion. The study recognized negative repercussions for some workers, but on a whole said U.S.-born employees were wealthier by about $431 million in 2010 because of this program. Coming up, Disney chair and CEO Bob Iger will be joining us live. We will cover the company's latest earnings report, plus why it will stop selling movies to Netflix and what it all means. This is Bloomberg. Russia is making a push into cryptocurrency. A company co-owned by one of President Vladimir Putin's internet advisors plans to raise as much as $100 million in a push to help Russian entrepreneurs challenge China in Bitcoin mining. Russian miner Coin is holding an initial coin offering where investors will use units of Ethereum or Bitcoin to buy new tokens. These new tokens will have rights to 18% of the revenue earned with the company's mining equipment. David Letterman is making a return. He's teaming up with Netflix for a yet-to-be-named series that'll feature in-depth interviews and in-the-field segments. There will be six hour-long episodes, which will premiere on Netflix next year. Letterman spent 33 years as a late-night talk show host and retired back in May 2015. And an update on a story we've been following. According to various reports, the hackers that attacked HBO leaked more files online this week and demanded a multi-million dollar ransom. The files included Game of Thrones scripts and company emails. A person calling themselves Mr. Smith told HBO the ransom must be paid or more data would be released. The network is continuing to investigate. And coming up, we'll be joined by Disney chair and CEO Bob Iger. He will break down the company earnings report and the move to dump Netflix in favor of Disney's own streaming service. This is Bloomberg. Disney is once again shaking up the media industry, saying it will stop selling movies to Netflix and begin offering ESPN sports programming and family films directly to consumers via two new streaming services. I want to get straight to our David Weston in New York. David, take it away. Thanks so much, Emily. We have the man of the hour, Bob Iger. He's the chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company, joining us from the West Coast. So, Bob, this is a major strategic move, as you've said, for the Walt Disney Company. Uh, it going over the top, if I can put it that way, not only with ESPN, people were asking about that, but also with Disney and Pixar. My question is, why now? Why not a year ago or a year from now? Well, we've seen a pretty dramatic shift in the way media is consumed. It's becoming more and more app-based. You just mentioned it's related to uh, your 15-year-old son. I see it certainly with my kids and my grandkids. And a lot of the app-based consumption is done on over-the-top direct-to-consumer services. We've obviously got the great brands to be able to reach consumers directly because the brands are in demand and there's great passion for them. You need the technology to do that as well, and that's no easy task. It's not simple, particularly when it comes to streaming live sports where you have consumption at a very, very high level and it's all at once. So we bought a third of BAMTech a year ago. We had an option to buy control four years hence. 
We've accelerated our purchase of controls so that we could move into the space at a faster pace, at a faster rate than we had initially anticipated because of the opportunity that we see in the marketplace. It's that simple. It's a combination of brands, technology, and consumer trends. So talk, talk about the consumer for a moment because I know the Walt Disney Company and you personally really focus on the consumer, the consumer experience. In, at least initially, who is the target audience? Who do you think will use most often either this ESPN over the top or the Disney slash Pixar? Well, you're looking obviously on the sports side at the sports fan and as the ESPN fan as well. Sports is still among the most popular programming that's out there. In fact, if you look at the 100 top rated TV shows in the United States last year, 94 were live sports. ESPN obviously provides a lot of live sports on its linear channels. This service will provide an additional 10,000 additional live sporting events in its first year of operation. So we're looking to reach the passionate sports viewer, this passionate, passionate sports fan that wants to be able to watch sports on mobile devices, on you describe as over the top direct to consumer services with really high quality user interface. And essentially that's what we're providing. On the Disney side, we've got a global fan base. They're passionate. There's a great affinity to the Disney and Pixar product. It's families, it's parents, it's kids, it's even teenagers and certainly grandparents. So we reach basically everyone, and it's worldwide. It's not just in the United States. There's a great thirst for a Disney-branded product today, and we're, and we're going to serve that fan well. As you say, particularly the live sports program has really been a mainstay of television for some time, going all the way back to broadcast television, and certainly, knows, certainly everyone knows with respect to cable. Because of that, the cable distributors have been really reliant upon ESPN first and foremost. What do you expect the reaction to be from the cable distributors? Well, we're going to continue to distribute the ESPN linear channels uh, through the cable distributors. They've been good partners of ours over the years, and together we've managed to create a highly profitable business. The distributors and the programmers alike have been experiencing the disruption that the whole market really is seeing and multiple businesses are seeing from advances in technology and changes of consumer behavior because of that, and we feel we have to react accordingly. My guess is that the distributors will look at this probably you know, more as a threat than anything else. It's not intended to be that. What we're doing is we're reacting to marketplace conditions and we're taking advantage of the quality of our brand, the passion and the product that we create and the technology that enables us to reach uh, consumers directly. You look at Disney's businesses, by the way, except for the theme park business, virtually all of our businesses touch the consumer through third party distributors. That's everything from big box retailers to um, the owners of motion picture, or the uh, the motion picture theaters, and I could go on and on. This is an opportunity for us to reach the consumer directly, and that's a, an important step for the company in terms of growth. So, Bob, help me make sure I understand this correctly. Again, stick with ESPN just for a moment. If I sign up for this app the moment it's available, it's available early 18, is that right? Yes. So if early I, 18. If I sign it's up one for this, app, so it's the ESPN app. You're but I won't get all of ESPN programming right. unless I've authenticated through my cable provider. Is that correct? That's correct. So there's one app that exists today. You can watch ESPN's linear channels on that app. This will give you the ability to buy access to another 10,000 live events through that same app experience with a subscription, what should be a very, very user-friendly method as far as, as, far as we can tell. Uh, and, and eventually, I guess you could maybe maybe uh, uh, predict that you'll be able to watch the linear channels in a similar fashion, meaning subscribe to them directly, but we don't have plans to do that right now. Uh, we'll watch the marketplace and see how it evolves. Uh, is this the beginning of the end for the bundle, do you think? I think that's a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit too strong. I don't think it's the beginning of the end at all. We've seen erosion of the bundle as uh, new entrants in the marketplace offer consumers options. Um, but no, I think it's still, first of all, it's still highly profitable. Secondly, I think it's still a very good consumer proposition. There have been incursions on the bundle, whether it's from new over-the-top providers, YouTube, Hulu, Hulu being uh, you know, a couple of them. In fact, we're, we're an owner of Hulu, so we know about that. Uh, there's more competition to reach consumers with multi-channel services. Um, I don't think this is necessarily the beginning of the end, but I think it represents a continued shift in consumer behavior and 
and the opportunity that technology provides us. When a CEO like you makes a major strategic decision like this, they inevitably have to ask themselves, do I build it or do I buy it? Did you go through that process? Did you consider buying something, for example, like a Netflix? Why did you decide to build it rather than buy it? Well, in a way, this is a buy as well. We're buying a technology platform that's enabling us to uh, create these businesses and go into the space uh, much faster than we would have had we built it. I'm not going to comment on whether we looked at Netflix or what other acquisition opportunities that we've looked at or have had. We obviously have the financial wherewithal, wherewithal to do a number of things, but this seemed to be the best step for not only the Walt Disney Company, but for our shareholders in terms of creating a growth strategy, really growing the company long term, taking a long term view, which is really important, but also addressing some of the near term issues that we're seeing, which is all, all about the disruption created by digital technology. In the sports uh, app, the ESPN app, uh, you have some major sports in there. You've got the NHL, you've got the MLB, the Major, major League Baseball, you've got uh, college sports. I don't see NFL at this point. I don't see NBA. Are there plans to add those, and under what terms could you get them in? Well, we intend to license sports specifically for this app uh, beyond the sports that have already been licensed, either by BAMTech, because they've been in the business of licensing, or by ESPN. This creates an opportunity for us to monetize in more effective ways through subscription revenue as well as through advertising revenue and in all the ways that a direct-to-consumer relationship can, can generate revenue. And so I think you can expect that uh, this, this product will be in the marketplace uh, to license more aggressively from basically multiple sports organizations, possibly even including the NFL and the NBA, where we have great relationships. I noticed in your uh, release you said, and I'll quote here, that you're, you plan to make significant investment in an annual slate of original movies, TV shows, short-form content for your Disney app. Are, are we talking about the sorts of investments we've seen from the likes of HBO, for example, uh, or we've seen from Amazon, we've seen from Netflix? Well, I think you've got to be careful there because Netflix, I can't comment on what Amazon's been investing, but it's pretty widely known that Netflix has been investing billions of dollars in original content. They've done so very effectively. I think what you mentioned, when you mentioned HBO, maybe this is a little bit more akin to that. We're going to basically produce, we're already developing, original movies and original television series specifically for this uh, Disney-branded service. And it will be incremental investment to the investments we've been making in television and, and motion pictures in the past. So, so Bob, Bob, finally, let me ask you the big question. I think you started when, how old, 21 when you came to ABC? You've spent your entire career, quite an amazing career. Would you recommend to a 21-year-old son, because you have a son not far away from that, I think, would you recommend that he go into this business, go into this company the way you came into ABC and spend a career here? Well, absolutely. You know, we're one of the more attractive companies for uh, people to work for, particularly college graduates. You know, those brands and that intellectual property and the reach that we have among consumers and the high esteem that people have for the Walt Disney Company and its various sub-brands, I think provides an unbelievably uh, attractive and uh, career for young people. There's a huge amount of potential here. You know, when you think about the company and you think about the world, we're about great storytelling, great branded storytelling, and you can't look at it in terms of how it's distributed in one, you know, one time or the other. You have to look at basically the, the quality of the brands and the, and the passion that people have for it and the opportunities that creates people who are managing to touch those brands from, from a career perspective. It's been great for me, and I would recommend, uh, you know, my, my sons won't be able to work here until after I leave, but they'll have, maybe have that opportunity. <laughs> Bob, thank you so much. That's Disney chairman and CEO Bob Iger. Hi, David. Us. Emily, back to you out in San Francisco. All right, David Weston there with Disney CEO Bob Iger. So much to discuss. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow. That is it for this edition of Bloomberg Tech. Do not miss that Sheryl Sandberg will be joining me tomorrow on Bloomberg Studio 1.0.